This morning I'm going to be preaching, I'm starting in the, in the Christmas season a little bit, and my title of my message is very simply this, Here Comes Christmas. And uh, as you look at this title, and I mean it's pretty simple, most of us have put away our, our Thanksgiving dinner, our leftovers are just about gone, um, I've tried to do my best to clear out ours at our house, um, but I was watching a, a news broadcast the other day, uh, a few weeks ago I guess it was, and and there was an, an, a news announcer that said, look out, everyone, here comes Christmas. And as he said that, I began to, uh, my mind just began to kind of wander through that. My first thought was, is how quickly time has passed. How quickly this year has clicked over. It just seems like just the other day we were celebrating Christmas last year. It just seems like the other day my wife was yelling at me about getting the Christmas decorations down. Maybe she was yelling at me the other day, but that, anyways, time has passed, and a year has gone by, and it's, speed, it's been sped by, and I begin to think about what have I done this year, and what, what really stands out with me in this past year? Have I met my goals? Did I lose those 40 pounds that I promised I would work on? Did I begin to exercise every day like I promised I would? It's awful quiet in here today right now. Some of you must be feeling really guilty right now. I thought about all those kind of things that I had set for goals for last year. I wonder, did I do those? Secondly, I began to wonder and dread all of the things that were coming up. I knew that everybody was coming into the house for Thanksgiving and we would have uh, food and everybody would be running everywhere and all the kids would be everywhere. And, and I, I thought about all of the, the stuff that I had to do. I, I thought about going to the store when people, you take your life in your hands when you, you take a, a parking spot in the grocery store uh, during Thanksgiving season. I mean, they literally turn their turn signal on before they get in the parking lot to find the spot. And I, I go shopping and I do most of the grocery shopping and I, I was waiting to get into the line and as I went to park I found a spot that was right up front and I, I whipped in there and I thought man look out. Of course it was five o'clock in the morning there was hardly anybody in the store. But I got right up in front and I began to think about all, I began to dread all the things that I had to do, hang the Christmas lights, decorate, get the, the stuff out here at church and do the decorations. I, I began to think about all that was going on and, and I began to think about what was going to take place in the next few, the busyness that would be going on, the activities, the, the, the things that were happening. I, I mean, watching the, the commercials on TV, I, I dread, I was beginning to dread almost the fact that, oh no, here goes the bank account. You know, and I began to think about all those things and I thought Christmas is coming again and here comes Christmas. Thirdly, I began to reflect on the birth of Christ and I began to think about how beautiful this season is about how we, we, we have the Savior who came, born of a virgin, came to, to seek and to save. He came to give his life. He was born in a manger so that he could die on a cross. The cruelty of that nature of that begins to speak to us. And no matter what we think or whatever place we put it in, you will find yourself today hurriedly heading towards Christmas. Christmas is here and cr coming very quickly to us. Even though that, that we try to pause it and put the, 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 everything on pause to keep the season from slowing down, it's coming quickly. The title of my message is very simply this, Here Comes Christmas. Here we are today on the verge of another Christmas. I want to, I want to learn, and I'm going to tell you how to, I feel like the best way to handle Christmas is to learn from a man by the name of Simeon. Now, Simeon was a prophet in the temple of God, and he had worked, and he was a Levitical priest, and he was one of the men who who had waited for the, the consolation of, of Israel. He was waiting for the birth of Christ. He was waiting for the Messiah to come. He was waiting for the one to come that was promised and prophesied of. He was waiting for that victory. And some of us have waited for this season to come. We've waited. We've seen it. We've, we know about it. We, my, I, my grandkids, we don't much more than get the packages put up and the trees down and they start thinking about what they're going to put on their list for next year. 
This first Christmas was one that was waited for. Many of the prophecies were given and prophesied over 2,000 years the birth of Jesus Christ. For over 400 years, the silence had come. Only thing that they had was the prophecies of a Messiah that would come, that a sign that would be given to them, that a virgin would give birth and the Savior would come. The difficulty was is that many had given up. Many had lost focus and many had lost what the meaning of Christmas was really about. That first Christmas was one who would ring in the life and the message of Jesus Christ. You see, when we think about this uh, passage of Scripture that I'm going to read today, we don't know how long, but we do know that, that Simeon was very old in his years and he had waited for a long time. Has anybody ever here waited for a long time? Because most of the time we live day and age. Come on, we get mad at the, 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 uh, when we stick something in the microwave that it doesn't get done fast enough. I want to I wanna know when they split the atom again and they make the microwave even go faster. You know, you don't even, you just, all you do is stick it in, pull it out, it's done. But we get so mad. I, 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 I was watching the other day and we were, we were going through the things that we, we used to take for hours to do. I mean, come on, how many of you Remember the days to when it actually took all day to set up and, and get the meals ready and, and cook like that. <laughs> she must not look, know about those microwave meals or something, you know. And uh, No, I, 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 get, I, I thought about all the things that we have and, and I, I thought about how Simeon had waited patiently. He had waited and persevered. And many of the people in Israel had given up. And today, maybe you're at that place to where you're ready to give up because you've waited and waited and waited for God to answer. You've waited and waited and waited for God to bring the solution to your problems. And some of you may have said, I don't know if it's ever going to happen. But I will tell you, there's a, a Savior and he promised that he would meet you and he would provide for you and he would supply your needs. Simeon was that man. But I want you to look at Simeon's life. And today, if we can take a few things from Simeon's life, I believe it will help us to prepare for the season of Christmas as we go through it. In Luke, the, the second chapter, verse 25 and 26, it says, Behold, there was a, a man in Jerusalem whose name was Simeon. This man was just and devout, waiting for the consolation of Israel. And the Holy Spirit was upon him, and it had been revealed to him by the Holy Spirit that he would not see death before he had seen the Lord's Christ. When we think about Simeon there, we begin to realize a couple things immediately out of that text. The first thing we realize is, is that he was a just and devout man. That he was just and devout. This statement tells us about how, uh, about his character and about who he was and what kind of man he was. It is very important as we go through this very busy season that we don't lose our character. We don't lose who we are in Christ. We, we, we can, uh, listen, I, I watched a video that was sent to me from a friend that, that said he was in the mall and watched a fight break out between two women over the, an item that was the last item on a Black Friday sale. I saw some kids took advantage and tried to steal somebody's gift who came out of the mall and was carrying a gift and they stole them and the, they actually got down in that, and rolled around in a parking lot. And we get so, listen, it is more important for you to maintain your character in this stressful season than anything else. Who you are and what you stand for is very important. Simeon was, uh, treated people with honesty and fairly. He, he was treating them as who they were. He was a man that was just and devout. He was a man who stood for his principles and stood behind them. He didn't try to summarize. He, he didn't try to, to belittle anyone. He was accepted among all, and he accepted others. And though we sometimes are only human, we always need to be careful of how we represent our Christ that lives in us. You see, you may be the only Christ that people see at Christmas time. Don't be surprised this season if you stand in a line. And people get mad. None of you would ever do that. None of you would fight over a parking space. 
because it was a little closer to the door. None of you would be the type that when you get to a, a place of a restaurant where a, a, a person who has been working in the restaurant has, has worked for days taking care of people's needs and a little bit frustrated and a little bit tired and she's not maybe right on top of getting you your refills, that you get mad and you lose your temper. This is a busy season and a struggled time and you're not the only one going through it. Turn to somebody and say, it's important how you act. I, he, yeah. Some of you were afraid to look at that person beside you on the fact that they might be guilty. So we, we, we must be realizing this. The thing about Simeon was is that everybody knew him and everybody knew what he was. The, the thing is that you need to know that when you tell people you're a Christian... We got people that carry a, a Bible or wear a cross or talk about it. They, 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 they tell people and their, their fellow employees uh, that they are Christian and they represent Christ in where they go. And then they live like the devil when it comes to Black Friday. Come on, amen. I never will forget a call I got one time on a... Saturday morning of someone who had been guilty of changing the tags on a Black Friday sale just so they could get a better TV a little bit cheaper. Called me and said, Pastor, I'm, I got in trouble and I need you to pray for me that I get out of trouble. I said, well, what kind of trouble did you get into? He said, I, all I did was... When he explained to me what he did, I said... Well, I tell you what I'll do. I'll pray that you get what you justly deserve. He goes, please don't pray that way. <laughs> Sometimes we want to get advantage of the opportunities. We want to get ahead. We want to take advantage. But it is more important for us to be just and devout. That more than anything else, the thing is patience pre uh, prepares us for the preparation of what we're going through. Those, don't you just love it? Listen, please. Be careful when you pray for patience. Because the development of patience is one that you have to go through a lot of struggles, problems, and difficulties. That's why James said, Count all joy when I fall into diverse temptations. Because he was leading up to the conversation about how that it would create in us patience and perseverance. And I don't know about you, but sometimes my patience gets on the end. Sometimes you push to the limit and sometimes you're, you progress to the point where you're saying, I don't know if this is worth it. But I will tell you something. When you get to that edge, you've got to lean into Christ. Here's what Simeon had to go through. Go ahead and pull that next one up. Simeon, when he was there, he lived what he had claimed to be. I'm going to ask you this. Are you guilty of living enough of Christ's likeness that people would say you're a Christian? You see, the whole idea of being a Christian is, is that your life represents Christ. And when I do the godly things and I do righteous things and I do good things, listen, it's good to give thanks. Some of us, we, the only time we want to do something good is when we get the accolade of others. I don't know about you, but I'd rather get the accolades of God than I would of anybody else on this earth. And do what you do because you please him. Go ahead. Well, I like what Paul said. Paul said this. He said, imitate me just as I also imitate Christ. You'll never mislead anyone if you represent them as Christ would do this. Would Christ honk at someone? Give them the California howdy? Would... would would that be what Christ would do in the parking lot? Would he, would he switch tags on a TV just to get a little benefit? How, how, would, how would Christ act? And the patience and the perseverance of that. If I'm going to represent anything, I want to represent Christ to a world that needs a Savior. And they need to know that this is, if this is sometimes, I, I looked at Black Friday and I thought, why, they, why in the world would they call it Black Friday? Because the real Black Friday was when Christ died on the cross. But when he died on the cross, actually what it did was the world may have been dark, but our lights begin to shine. And what the best thing that we can do on this season right now is let the light of Jesus Christ that's in you shine brighter than ever before. Amen? Amen? 
representing Christ now is what the world needs. Go ahead and pull that next one up. He was waiting on the Messiah to come, the hope of Israel. When we look at that, we begin to see that the hope of Israel comes in. And they were waiting for Christ. And most people believe that he had waited since he was a young lad. And he had been raised up that Jesus is coming back. And, and he's coming. And he's coming. The Messiah is coming. There are still those that are waiting for the Messiah to come. There are still those that, that, that missed it. That they didn't recognize who Christ was. But the Bible tells us that Christ came so that he was the promised Messiah. He fulfilled all the prophecies. And he became everything that was needed. And here Simeon knew this was the Savior. This was the one. This was the one who had been promised to come. He knew the fact that Mary, when she brought Jesus to be, be circumcised, and, and when she brought him to the temple to dedicate the sacrifices that were given for him, that she realized this is what the world needs. You see, I can tell you this. There is a hope that happens in each of us this time of year. Every time that Christmas rolls around, I think about the birth of Christ. That's what we should do, right? Amen? He is the reason for the season. He gives us hope. There's a world that's darkened and they need hope and they need hope. The second thing that I realize is, is that when, he, when I recognize Christmas season, I love what the songs that Naomi was singing about because not only was it representing the, the birth of Christ, but many of the songs that we sing because Christ didn't come to stay in a manger. He came to be crucified as a lamb that was slain for my sins and your sins which gives me the hope of, of eternal life, which gives me a hope of a future. And every time that I think about Christmas, I know I'm one step closer to that hope that I have in heaven. Amen. Amen. And if I can keep my focus that this is not all there is. Come on, amen. The tangibility of our life is our hope in heaven. You can't have enough things to make you happy here. Somebody said, well, let me try. Here's the problem. The more things we have, the more debt we have, the more debt we have, the more frustrated we become. Come on. And just because, I like that bumper sticker that they, they put on the cars that, that, that I read the other day, and I, was, I saw it, it says, I have more toys than you, but I also have more bills than you. Listen, I, when I think about the hope that I have, it's not, I don't hope for... I, my kids asked me, they said, what do you want for Christmas? Has anybody asked you that, that yet this year? Chuck? What do you want for You know what I, I told my wife? She said, what do you want for Christmas this year? I said, I really don't want anything. I said, I really don't know. I don't, don't really want anything. And she said, you got to want something. I said, I want you to leave me alone. <laughs> I said, I don't want anything. Just, just the peace of God that I can have when I, that on that Christmas morning I can wake up in the peace. And do Let me tell you something. The first thing that I believe Simeon did when he held Jesus in his hands and said, this is the risen Savior, he said, joy to the world, peace has come. The hope of the world is that the peace of God that passeth all understanding would set in their lives. And when we represent Christ, when we see this, when we hold on to it, we can realize the hope that he has. In Ephesians, the second chapter, Paul writes this. He says, therefore, remember that you, once Gentiles in the flesh who are called uncircumcision by what is called the circumcision made uh, in the flesh by hands, that at the time you were without Christ, being aliens from the commonwealth of Israel, and strangers uh, from the covenant of promise, having no hope and without God in the world. Paul writes a pretty gloomy picture of what the world would be. A hopeless world. There are people that literally hold on to nothing, that have no hope for what the future is. My hope and my joy is not, listen, I'm going to tell you this, the goal that we should have as a Christian is that we lay up treasures in heaven. Come on, amen? And if we can lay up treasures in heaven, the, the Bible says that Roth, they, don't, they don't rust or they don't decay or they don't fall apart. They don't quit working. They don't, you don't lose the charger. You don't lose the things that are out there. Come on. 
We don't, uh, how many of you have bought your kids gifts and that day they have broken the toy before the day's over? It happens all the time. You, you give them a gift. Listen, I remember when my son Brandon was just a small baby and I can remember when, when he was playing there and he would, we would get him a gift and we would get him something real nice to play with and a nice toy and, and he would play with the box <laughs> instead of the toy. It's not about things, people. It's the contentment that you have in your heart. When Simeon held the baby, he said, this is the peace that passeth all understanding. This is the peace that the world needs. And I can tell you this, if you can do anything, share the peace of God that He brings in your life. And if you're walking around stressed and frustrated today, if you're struggling with situations and circumstances in your life, that peace has not entered into you yet. You truly haven't got a hold of who He is. Because once you do, you will know the peace that I'm speaking of today. When Simeon got a hold of that baby and began to dedicate him and, and say, this is the beautiful child. I loved it last week when we were dedicating the kids and I began to think about how cute and how potential, how much, uh, how much of a, a promise they were and wh what a future they had. I can tell you this, it is a fearful thing when you have a child in the world today. I don't know what these kids are going to face. I look at some of the kids and, and some of the things that they, they have never grown up without a TV in the home. They have, most of them have never known what it is not to have a microwave. Most of them, come and look at your teenagers, they're there too. Most of them do not remember when we didn't have a cell phone. Oh, those were the good old days. Most of them don't remember those days when uh, the cars didn't drive by themselves. I'm, when we think about all that and we see that, uh, my mom was, was visiting with us and Don, she was, it was kind of funny, she, she was sitting there and one of the Waymo cars drove by me with the dome on the top and the little thing spinning around. She goes, oh, isn't that cute? I said, that's a driverless car, Mom. No way! She wanted me to speed up so I could look in to see if anybody was there. I said, Mom, they sit in the front seat. They just don't have to steer. She goes, I am not trusting somebody like that. I am not. She says, I barely trust your dad. I'm not trusting somebody that's not there. Today, if there's anything that we can do is to present Christ... But once, we, once Christ gets a hold of us and, and us get a hold of Christ, the peace of God that passeth all understanding can be represented through our life. I got a couple other things that I want to share on this idea of this hope that God gives us. God had a plan in hope of eternal life, which God, who cannot lie, promised before time began, but has in due time manifested His word through preaching, which was committed to me according to the commandment of, our, of God, our Savior. Go ahead and pull that next one up. God had a plan. God had a message. God told them He was going to send a sign. The children of Israel had waited for almost 600 years according to the prophecies that were given in Isaiah. Isaiah asked and, and began to talk to Ahaz, the king of Israel, who was surrounded by the Syrian armies and they were troubled on every side and they, they were worried about what was going to happen next, that they would even die at that point and they were worried about their life and what their future... Anybody else in this house worried about anything right now? You worried about some things? Worried about bills? Worried about finances? Worried about family? Worried about circumstances that... I mean, come on. We, we all do. We, worry. we, get, we get literally... We, I mean, we, we are... We literally eat our stomach up because of the worries that happen. And so we see worry becomes a part of it. Isaiah came to Ahaz and began to say, what do you want? What do you want me to do? Ahaz, well, listen, he said, pray that we can defend ourselves against these enemies that come in, that God would protect us. And Isaiah asked this question. He said, ask a sign for yourselves from the Lord your God, and ask it either in the depth or the height or above. Go ahead and pull that next one up. A few verses down in verse 12, and he says, Ahaz replied, I will not ask 
nor will I test the Lord. When he said that, he was simply saying this, I trust God and I'm not going to ask God for anything. Listen, if you are troubled and you are having trouble finding peace, you need to ask the only one who can bring it. And that is God. You can struggle with this. You can continue to fight with your problems and your circumstances and your situations. Or you can turn and say, God, I trust in you. I put my faith in you, God. I quit trying to carry this thing. I quit trying to figure this thing out. And God, I trust in you. And see, when Ahaz began to do that, he was rebuking. He said, no, 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 I can't ask God. I won't ask God. Go ahead, pull that last one up. And it says, and therefore, the Lord himself will give you a sign. Behold, a virgin shall conceive and bear a son and shall call his name Emmanuel. Of course, the, the prophecy was given and the, the curiosity became the, the nature of that. That prophecy was one that hinged on all of Israel for their future. When would this happen and when would this come? And every season they would come together and they would try to figure out. And on that season when Jesus Christ was born, in the, in the fullness of time is what Galatians says, that when Christ was brought forth in the fullness of who he was, in Galatians 4, uh, he begins to talk about the nature of who Christ was at that appointed time. God said, I will bring forth a, from a virgin. The significance of that is, and I'm, I'm preach about this in a few weeks, but... It had to be a virgin. It could not be an earthly father to Jesus Christ. Or he would not have been a worthy sacrifice to bring the peace. You see, because whether you know it or not, how many of you have an earthly father? Some of you are just too lazy to raise your hands. None of you were hatched. None of you were born on your own. It takes two to tango and you were brought here by that. Because we have an earthly father, we are... And one of the songs that Naomi was singing was about the idea of this curse that's placed upon all mankind. Every one of us were born into sin. And it could not be an earthly man to sacrifice. It had to be someone without an earthly father. And God sent forth his son so that he could be conceived of the Holy Spirit. And I begin to think about that. Can you imagine when they did blood tests to figure out what blood type Jesus was? How many of you know what blood type you are right now? If you do, if you don't, you need to, you need to go find out. You need to know what blood type you are. It's important for you to know that. Mine's red. For the rest of you, I don't know what yours is. So I, I just know that... Uh, we were at the hospital with my wife and she, when she was there and they were doing all these blood things and they, they first stuck her and it started coming out purple then it turned red and I said, oh, she's changing. I don't know, listen. But Jesus did not have the blood type. His DNA. Now they can tell you who your earthly father is almost to a precise point if, you, if they take the blood type of you and they can figure out who your father was on a DNA test. I wonder what they did on Jesus' DNA test. <gasps> he doesn't have a father. His, his father is not of this world. God had a plan, and God had a plan from Genesis. In the beginning of creation, God had a plan to bring forth one who was perfect without sin, and it had to be his son, conceived of the Holy Spirit. Had to be, he had to deliver and become man so he could be sacrificed for the sins of man. He had to be born. And all the prophecies that talk about his birth were the prophecies that talked about how he was born. He would be born in the city of Jerusalem. He would be born of the tribe of Judah. He would be born at a place and a point in time that he would be born and conceived. And somebody said, well, God, had, God could have picked a, a, a day's in or a hospital or something for Jesus to be born in. God had to show forth his humility and to fulfill all the prophecy, he had to be born the way he was born. And when he was born in, in the manger, when he was born there that first Christmas morning, and, and as we begin to look at this, there was much confusion that was on Mary's face. There was much confusion about it. But when Simeon took him in his hands and began to say, this is the peace that we have sought for all these years. Listen, I'm going to tell you something this morning. You can run to every counselor and every doctor that you can find. 
You can go everywhere around the globe to try to find peace, but there is only one place I know that you can guarantee peace to find it, and that is in Jesus Christ. This Christ who came to be given for the sacrifice of you and I, the one who came to bring peace, change the world that peace might be found. Today, maybe you're going through a circumstance that's difficult. Maybe you don't understand exactly everything that's going on in your world. But I can tell you this. God promised that He would bring us a son. That He would be born. That He would be born of a virgin. And He will be the sign. And still yet, there were those who saw it and heard about it and knew about it that did not understand it. Can you imagine the astonishment as the shepherds ran through town and said, The, the Messiah has come. The Savior has come. Where's he at? What kingdom does he reign in? And they said he's in the stable. Scoffing at that. Some people would think that the peace that you're looking for would come through this big event or this big event, but there's no greater event than the birth of Jesus Christ. There's no greater peace that can come. Go ahead. He was... The Holy Spirit was upon him. The Bible says that the Holy Spirit was upon Simeon where he had a purpose and he knew the purpose. And many times we'll struggle if because we don't know our purpose in this world. We don't know the purpose that God has for us. It's difficult for us to find our place in this crazy world that we live in. And we find, we'll struggle with who, what I'm to do with my future and what I'm to do with the rest of my life. Believe it or not, when you were born, God had a plan already designed for your life. God had a perfect plan. And God had those steps, the Bible says, already prepared. How many of you know that we make a lot of wrong choices in life? Instead of choosing to follow or take up the the example of Christ, we wander in our own way. Sometimes when we wander our own way, we get away from God's plan. And so all the stress and everything that's piled up on us comes. Everything about the world comes. Come on. And a lot of the choices that we have made have led us to the point where we are right now. But I'm going to tell you something. When the Holy Spirit moves on the scene, it changes everything. And the Bible says that the Holy Spirit was on him. He had a purpose and a divine order. He had placed him where he was for a purpose that he would dedicate this child. That he would be the one that would hold him in his hands and declare to the world, this is the Messiah. This is the one. Go ahead and pull that next one. Zechariah 4 and 6 says this, And so he answered and said unto me, This is the, uh, the, the, my, the word of the Lord uh, to Zerubbabel, not by might nor by power, but by my spirit, says the Lord of hosts. There are those that are working and looking and doing everything they can do to try to change the circumstances. And until you surrender your life to Jesus Christ, this one born of a, of a, in a manger, this one born without an earthly father, this one conceived in a, of a virgin, must be the one that can bring the peace. This is your sign. I preached a message a few years ago. How many of you know that comedian that does that all the time that says, here's your sign? What was his name? Jeff Foxworthy. Jeff Foxworthy. I couldn't, uh, my mind went blank for a minute. And then you said it and I remembered it. Thank you. When I, when I look at this though, here's, here's the thing. Here's your sign. I can tell you, I can tell the world about a Savior who can change your world and change your life. Who can make things different and solve all your problems. And we'll still look for another sign. Because we don't like the sign we see. Uh, come on. We, we see the signs, we see the signs, and we keep going and we keep going. And because we want to see what we want to see, we want to hear what we want to hear. It's the way we want it, and that's the way it's got to be. God says, here's your sign. A virgin shall bring forth. Because it wasn't a sign that that many of the children of Israel wanted to see. Born in a manger, our king. One who would come in such a manner, that's not who I want to follow. One who was crucified as a criminal, that's not one who I want to follow. But he is the only savior. He is the Messiah. He is Emmanuel. 
He is God who came and dwelt among us. He is the one. He is the one. Not by might nor by power. Not by all the things that man can bring. Not by the sword or anything else. It's not by the structure of our own abilities. It's by the power that we have and the faith that we have in Almighty God. Jesus spoke to his disciples and he told them this and he promised them this as on his way to the cross as he prepared his disciples for his departure. And found in John, the 14th chapter, verses 16 and 17, it says, And I will pray the Father and he will give you a helper that he may abide with you forever. The Spirit of truth whom the world cannot receive because it neither sees him nor knows him. But you know him for he dwells with you and soon will be in you. The idea of this was Jesus departing and he was telling, listen, I don't know. Some people say, well, if I could see Jesus today, if Jesus was here, I would follow him. You ever had anybody say that? I've had him say that to me. If Jesus was real, let him show himself. You know what? I'm going to tell you something. I have the presence of the Holy Spirit in me and the work of Christ and the, and the example of Christ that I need is represented through me. When I look at this passage of Scripture, I begin to realize the, the nature of what Christ was speaking of here. That there is a helper that's coming. There is a promise that's coming. There is one who is to come that will help you, that will be not only with you, but in you. And the prophet had to come. When he, Simeon was speaking to the nations and he was speaking to the world, every time he would come to the temple, James, they would think the same thing. This is just another service. This is just another Sunday. This is just another day. What if today God said, if you have faith to believe, the faith as the, the grain of a mustard seed, if you have that faith, and believe you could receive. When I ask if you were troubled and you had some worries in your life, most everybody in this place nodded or shook their hands and some of you actually testified to it and lifted your hands. But here's the thing. Do we have enough faith to believe? Do we have enough faith? Is, is the power of the Holy Spirit that, that's moving in this place right now, the Holy Spirit's moving on some of you right now at this very moment in this service, and He's speaking to you, do you believe that I can do what you've asked me to do? Do you believe it? Do you believe for the healing? Do you believe for the, the miracle? Do you believe for the provision? Do you believe for the way right now? Do you believe? Simeon was simply telling us this by the power of the Holy Spirit that was upon him. The Bible says that great tasks were done by those who the Holy Spirit would move upon. This was a great task because it was prophetically given that he would announce the coming and the birth of the Savior Jesus Christ. To all those who stood in the temple that day, they heard the declaration that this is the Messiah. They knew who he was by the power of the Holy Spirit. Simeon would declare the work of the Lord. And lastly, he had a prophetic sign. He had a, an opportunity, he had a promise that he held on to. He had a promise that he wouldn't let go of. That promise was declared to him years ago that said he would not die until he saw the birth of this one that was promised. That he would not, he would not die and death would not come to him until he saw it. How many times have you woke up and said, I don't know if that's ever going to happen. If God spoke to you and gave you a promise, you hold on to that promise. You don't cast it away because of doubt, because of circumstance, or because of the distance of time. Because circumstances didn't happen in the time frame that you thought it would happen in, we lose our patience and, and we begin to try to fix it for God and we try to solve it ourselves. And all we do is become more frustrated. Every promise that's written in the book that, that God has given to us, His Word to us, tells us the promises are for us. If we have faith to believe it, to receive it. I don't know what you're worried about today. I don't know what struggles may be facing you today, but right now, this Savior promised us that He would never leave us nor forsake us. This Savior promised us that He would supply all of our needs by His riches and glory. This Savior 
right now would be the remedy for your, your circumstances. We, if you're struggling in your health, he said, by, by his stripes we are healed. This morning, whatever that circumstance that the enemy has brought to attack you right now, the declaration is very clear. Are you holding on to the promise that will change your life forever? Can you imagine how many times Simeon went to the temple to dedicate a child and think, is this it? Is this it? Is this it? But when he held Jesus, he knew. All the details were filled in, and the answer was there. I'm going to tell you something. It may be right now that God is just saying, open your eyes. The answer is right there. The, the solution to your problems is right there. Do you have faith to believe it? Go ahead and pull that scripture up. 2 Peter chapter 3, verse 9 says, The Lord is not slack concerning His promises, as some count slackness but is long-suffering towards us, not willing that any should perish, but that all should come to repentance. When I look at that scripture, it jumps out to me the very nature of Christ in Himself, who He is and what He's about. The promise that He has. Some of us have become impatient because God didn't do it fast enough for us. He didn't do it in the way that we thought He should. And because of that, we have lost our hope. We have lost our belief. This morning, I'm speaking to so many of you. You, You're thinking this is good for somebody else, but I'm believing today it's good for for you right now. I'm believing that some of you are about ready to cast it in and say, I don't believe He can, but my God can do all things. I want us to stand all across this place this morning. Simeon. Got to unwrap that swaddling baby. See him for the first time. My hope is this, that one day I will see him face to face. That's my joy. That's what I'm looking for. That hope that I have is for my future, not for this moment. For this next few minutes, I'm going to ask you to do this with me right now. Some of you, if you would be honest with yourself, you know that these worries that you're facing right now, you face for a while. I felt this from the very time that God began to speak to my heart about this. And some of you are worried about some things that you're really struggling with. What am I going to do for my future? What am I going to do? What's tomorrow going to bring? I'm going to ask you right now to bow your heads with me all across this place. And I want you to look deep within your heart. Your tomorrows are already in God's hands. He already knows what you're going to face. He already knows that. When we think about the hurriedness of Christmas and all the details of everything that's going to happen and all the the problems, am I going to have enough? Am I going to see this? Is this going to happen? Right now, I want you to do two things with me. The first thing is, is that if you have never surrendered your life to Jesus Christ, you can accept His gift, the gift of Jesus Christ right now. Right now.